Hello folks, my name is Tim and welcome back to my channel. So in today's video, we've got something quite interesting to look at because I've got hold of one of these. This is the brand new Arduino Nano RP2040 Connect. It's the latest board from Arduino and it features the RP2040 Raspberry Pi silicon that you'll also find on the Raspberry Pi Pico and the various RP2040 controller boards that are starting to be manufactured. Now, this board is particularly interesting because it features a large number of extra add-on modules. So, let's take a closer look. Okay, so here I have a regular Raspberry Pi Pico and a regular Arduino Nano. And in between them you can see the brand new Arduino Nano RP2040 Connect. Now immediately we can see that this board is slightly smaller than our Pico here and it actually has slightly fewer I.O. pins and that's because it shares the same form factor and layout as the Arduino Nano. Now it's tempting to think of the new Arduino Nano RP2040 Connect as being merely the combination of these two boards, but actually it's considerably more than that because this module has a number of built-in goodies that make it very interesting indeed. However, it does come with a price tag to match because this board costs £25 here where I live and that's in contrast to the Pico that only costs four. So let's take a look at this board, see what's built in, what makes it so exciting and what you get for your money. The Nano RP2040 Connect's datasheet has a nice block diagram that illustrates a number of extra modules and how they're connected to the main RP2040 chip. Let's see what's on board. First we have an MP2322 switch mode step down converter. That's a nice efficient power converter that can handle voltage ranges from 3 volts to 22 volts and provides a steady 3.3 volt supply for the RP2040. So, you can power the board from a wide range of sources. It should be noted though that the I.O. pins are not protected and you should only use a 3.3 volt logic level. We have an MP34DT06 JTR MEMS microphone. That's a solid state omnidirectional microphone and I guess that's been included to allow the controller to be used in voice command applications and similar things. At the heart of it all, we obviously have the RP2040 chip itself and an additional 16 megabytes of flash memory. Next, we have an ECC608 authenticator chip offering hardware accelerated cryptographic capabilities. This is probably intended to offload operations needed for TLS certificate management tasks and secure communications in an IoT style setup. It also features a high quality random number generator that could be handy in some applications. Interestingly, the next module is an ST LSM6 DSO XTR 6 axi IMU. That's an inertia measurement unit, and it features a 3D gyroscope and a 3D accelerometer for tilt and motion detection. This module also features a machine learning element apparently, so that's going to be interesting to play with. Perhaps building motion controllers for virtual reality, maybe fitness monitoring devices, or perhaps even some form of movement detection network from a number of connected boards. Hmm, lots of possibilities there. Anyway, Next we have a Nina W102 communication module and this supports Bluetooth, Bluetooth Low Energy and 802.11 B, G and N Wi-Fi communication standards and this module is actually built around an internal ESP32 chip. And finally we have an RGB LED and this is connected directly to the Nina module and is provided in addition to the power LED and the built-in status LED. Okay, so this board is clearly designed to meet the demands of modern day makers, offering loads of scope for IoT and voice activated applications, with some nice motion detection goodies thrown in for good measure. Over the next few videos, I'm going to be experimenting with the various features offered by the Arduino Nano RP2040 Connect and demonstrating some simple applications to get started with. So first up today, let's take a look at the solid state microphone. But of course, before we can do that, we need to get our development environment set up. 
I'm going to be using my Raspberry Pi 4 desktop, and that means I'll be using the Arduino IDE version 1.8, because at the time of recording this, there is no IDE version 2.0 build available for the Raspberry Pi's ARM processor. In order to create code for the Nano RP2040 Connect, we need to install some supporting components and libraries, and the process of doing this is covered by a quick start guide that you can find on the Arduino website. Basically, we need to install support for the Arduino Embed OS Nano boards. OK, with that all done, let's test our new environment by compiling and uploading everyone's favourite Blink sketch. Ah, OK, well that's not as successful as we might have liked. It seems something isn't working. After a bit of searching around, I found a post on the Arduino forums that states you need to run a post install script after installing the embed OS board support in the IDE. This script was hidden away at the location shown, though that path may change based on the version of the IDE you're using and the version of the board support package you have installed. Anyway, the script modifies the USB system rules on the host machine and just needs to be run once with super user permissions. Now, I don't know if you need to do anything like this on other platforms, but once completing this step on my Linux setup, everything uploaded and worked great. OK, so onto the microphone then. Now, I had planned on building a simple plug-and-play USB microphone using the tiny USB library to send data from the onboard mic to a host computer. However, the Arduino core provided for working with the Nano RP2040 does not seem to support the tiny USB stack. At least not yet, anyway. This is a bit of a shame, because it is available in the standard Pico SDK and in the community-built RP2040 core intended for working with the Pico from within the Arduino IDE. Hopefully the Arduino engineers, or maybe the community, will make this available soon, though, because it is a very nice library to have. OK, so I need a backup plan, then. Let's instead build a volume-level indicator using some NeoPixels. Now this isn't quite as interesting, but it's still something to play with, and perhaps I'll revisit the mic idea later. So, to begin with, let's take a look at the built-in microphone example. This code shows us how to read from the microphone using the PDM library that's provided as part of the IDE support package. PDM stands for Pulse Density Modulation, and it's the method used to encode the microphone's audio data. However, we don't really need to know much about the specifics of PDM because the library is going to handle all of the details for us. So, we can go ahead and just run this sketch now and see what happens. Well, that's pretty cool. It's visualizing the audio waveform using the serial plotter. So it should be a simple matter to take the output from this and instead plug it into some NeoPixels. And for this, we're going to need to install the Adafruit NeoPixel library, and you can find that in the library support section of the IDE. Okay, so here's the final sketch. Now, you're probably thinking, this looks pretty simple, and it really is. In fact, we'll go through the code in just a minute. However, while trying to make this work, I ran into a tricky problem. Both the PDM and the Adafruit NeoPixel library are, well, kind of broken, or at least incompatible. You see, both of these libraries make use of the RP2040 chip's PIO support internally. But, Neva Library provides a way to tell it which of the eight available state machines are free to use. So, of course, both libraries assume they can just go ahead and use state machine zero. This means the second library to set itself up will trash the PIO routine of the first. And, of course, bad things happen. Especially if you're also trying to use that particular state machine to run your own PIO code. 
Debugging this was an interesting experience until I delved into the source of these libraries and realised what was going on. In the end, I needed to modify the Adafruit library to use the second state machine rather than the first state machine, and everything started working as expected. Now I fully expect more libraries to start making use of the PIO system offered by the RP2040. It is pretty awesome after all. But please, library authors, let us pick the state machines that you're actually going to run those routines on so that we can avoid these kinds of conflicts. Anyway, with that bug fixed, let's take a look at the code. So obviously we're going to begin by including the header files for the libraries that we're using. And then we need to define a number of constants that we're going to use. So here we're defining some constants for the PDM setup. And that's the number of audio channels. We have a single channel, it's mono and the output PCM frequency. That's PCM rather than PDM. We also need to define some uh, variables to hold the samples that we're actually going to get back from the microphone. So we have this sample buffer here, which is large enough to hold 512 samples. Uh, next, we have an integer, which will actually tell us how many samples we, we actually put into that buffer. And uh, that's declared as a volatile int. Now it's volatile because the, uh, the samples are actually accumulated in a callback function that's called from an IRQ. So we need to declare the integer as volatile because it's accessed both from the main path of the code and from the IRQ handler. So uh, yeah, we need to tell the compiler that that's what's going to happen. Now next we have some constants for our LED strip. Now I have my LED data line connected to the pin D2 on my Arduino pinout, which is actually uh, GPIO pin number 25 as far as the RP2040 is concerned. Now there is probably a enum tucked away somewhere which hides the actual uh, GPIO numbers and it gives them the Arduino names. But uh, anyway, whatever, it's, uh, it's pin 25, so that's what I've set up here. Uh, now, my particular length of strip has just 20 LEDs on it, so the LED count is set to 20. Uh, brightness, of course, is, well, the brightness of the LEDs, and I've set that to 50, which is approximately one-fifth of the maximum brightness. So, once we've set up all of those constants, we can go ahead and create an instance of the Adafruit NeoPixel object, uh, and that's called strip here. We're going to pass it the LED count, the LED pin, and a couple of configuration flags which describe the type of the NeoPixel strip which is uh, being controlled. Now, if you're using a different NeoPixel strip to mine, you may need to configure this differently. But there's a bunch of different flags and they're explained in this comment underneath. Now, I'm using RGBW pixels at 800 kilohertz, but uh, you can pick from amongst these flags if that's not the same as what you have. Okay, so now we come to our setup function. Now, there's not very much going on here in the setup function. We're just going to initialize the uh, NeoPixel strip by calling begin and then show to set all the pixels to the off state. And then of course we need to set the brightness. So we'll just call set brightness. After that, we'll set up the serial interface and that's literally just so that we can communicate error messages back over the serial monitor in case something goes wrong. Uh, right, so now we're going to initialize the PDM library. So to do that, we need to call an onReceive method here to pass in a function that will be called uh, from an IRQ handler when there's data to be sampled from the microphone. And that's uh, this onPDMData function here. And we'll take a look at how that function works in just a moment. Uh, next, we're going to set the gain of the microphone. Now, I've set this to minus 20 here, but that was a fairly arbitrary decision based on fiddling around with things and looking at the output on my pixel strip. I basically just picked something that I thought kind of looked nice with the uh, audio inputs I was using. Okay, um, so once we've set up those properties for the PDM library, we can then call pdm.begin. Now this takes the channels and the PCM frequency constants that we previously defined and at that point, assuming everything went right, the, uh, the PDM system is now running and the microphone will be collecting samples in the buffer provided. Now if anything went wrong, well we'll just uh, print a little message over our serial interface and then we'll enter an infinite loop because we can't really do anything useful with this program if the uh, PDM microphone wasn't initiated properly. So that's everything for our setup function then. Let's take a look at the loop function. 
Now, the very first thing we're going to do here is to actually set all of the pixels to the off state for our pixel strip, and uh, that's what we're doing here. After that, we'll then say um, if samples read, so if we have any samples, then we're going to go into this block of code. Now, we're going to loop over all of the samples here in this loop, and we're actually only interested in the largest sample from amongst the available set. So we're going to keep track of that in this samp max variable, and we're basically going to say within the body of this loop that samp max is equal to the maximum value of whatever it is currently, or the absolute uh, value of the sample in the current location of the buffer. So the, the buffer samples can actually be negative. This is a signed value, um, but we're using the abs function to convert everything to the positive side of things. And then we're going to simply compare that to the current best sample using the max function. So once that's finished, samp max will have that value in it and we can move on to the next bit. Now, the next bit is to decide how many pixels we actually need to illuminate based on the value of that samp max. So to do that, we're going to take samp max and we're going to divide it by the maximum value that it could possibly be, which is the maximum positive value of a 16-bit integer, only expressed as a floating point. Now the result of this division is basically going to be a value between 0 or 1. So if the microphone reads back the absolute maximum value it can, then this uh, calculation will return 1. If it reads back nothing, this calculation will return 0. And if it reads back halfway between the two, then we'll get 0.5. It's basically a linear range between 0 and 1 that corresponds to the range that the microphone can sample. Now we'll take that 0 to 1 scalar and we'll use it to multiply out the number of pixels we actually have in our strip. So if we get 1, uh, then we'll light all of the pixels up, so that'll be 1 times the number of pixels. If we get 0, well, 0 times anything is of course 0, so we won't light anything. And if we get, let's say, 0 0.5, then uh, 20, which is the pixels I have, times 0 0.5 gives us 10. So we'll light up half of the pixels. So that works out how many pixels to light based on the sample value we got back from the microphone. So now that we know how many pixels we want to light, we can go into this loop here and actually light them up. So um, we need to work out the color, first of all, because in my demo, I want the pixels to start off as green. And as we climb higher and higher and higher, I want them to uh, kind of merge through to red. So to do that, I take 255, which is the maximum uh, color contribution for a single color channel. That could be red, green, or blue. Uh, and then uh, I divide it by the number of uh, LEDs we have. And that basically calculates a kind of step increment such that um, if we take 20 steps, we'll arrive at the 255 maximum value. So um, you can see how that basically um, works out the, the step or the, the difference we need to adjust each pixel as we move from pixel to pixel. We can just multiply it out by i, which is the current uh, pixel position or the index of this loop, basically. So once we've worked out what that uh, step value actually is, then we can plug it into this function strip.color. Now the first parameter here is actually the green channel. So we're going to set that to 255, which is maximum minus the step quantity. So if the step quantity is very low, it'll be 255 minus a very low number, possibly zero, which will give us a large contribution of green when X is low. Uh, the second parameter is the red uh, channel contribution, and we'll set that to just x. So when x is very low, we get a lot of green, and we get very little red, and we don't really care about the blue channel, we're not using it, so we just set that to zero. Now as x moves up higher and higher and higher, that is as we progress farther and farther along the LED strip, the green value will reduce because we'll be making this maximum value smaller until eventually x hits 255 and green becomes zero, and the red value will increase as x grows. So that should cause the LEDs to merge smoothly between green and red depending on how many we actually have in the strip. And the total number of LEDs doesn't really matter, this will work with any length of the strip, it just works out what the, the step size needs to be and how many steps it needs to take. 
So, okay, once we've done that, we can just set the uh, pixel color here and then we're done. Now we are done, so we'll set the samples read value to zero because we've consumed all of the samples in the buffer at this point. Uh, so we'll just basically need to wait for some more to come in via our uh, callback function and we'll look at that in a second. And then we need to call strip.show. And that's because the set pixel color function actually kind of sets an internal array that's sort of a buffer in memory. It doesn't actually light up the pixels just yet. We need to call strip.show to kind of commit all of the uh, pixel color settings that we've programmed with the set pixel color function. So that's it for our loop function then. There's not a huge amount going on here, but it should do the job quite nicely. So the last part of the program then is this on PDM data function. And this is the callback handler that will actually populate the sample buffer with data from the microphone. Now this bit of code is actually copied verbatim from the uh, PDM sample example. Uh, so let's just take a look at how it works. The first thing we're going to do is to ask the PDM library if we have any available data. So this dot available function. And if we do, we record that as a bytes available value. Uh, now, the next thing we're going to do is to read that data into our sample buffer. So we will read however many bytes there are um, from the microphone and put them into the buffer. Now, interestingly, the, the sample demo doesn't make any attempt to uh, cap this value. So if for some reason the sample buffer is actually too small to store all of the bytes available, then we'll have a buffer overflow. So this isn't actually a very safe function, unless of course the author knew that the bytes available value would never actually exceed the size of the buffer. Either way, it's not particularly good practice. There should be something like a min function used here to say read back the bytes available or the full size of the buffer, whichever is smaller because it's possible we might adjust the size of the buffer for some reason and well anyway basically it's just a safety thing so uh, once we've read into the buffer we then need to set the samples read value to whatever we got and um, as these are two bytes 16-bit uh, values we need to divide the bytes available by two to tell us how many samples we actually got and there we go that's the entire program so I'll be uploading this to GitHub as I do with all the code I write for these sorts of videos. If you want to take this code and play with it yourself, please do by all means. But you need to be aware of the fact that you'll have to modify the Adafruit NeoPixel library in order to set the appropriate state machine so it doesn't conflict with the PDM library. Now I'll put up a readme that explains how to do that, but it's something you'll need to do yourself. Anyway, I hope this has been an interesting introduction and exploration of the Arduino Nano RP2040 Connect, and I'll be making a few more of these videos over the next few weeks covering some of the other features that we haven't looked at yet. So, I think all that's left to do is to take a look at this demo in action. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.